My name is Jonathan Brewster. I'm the director of the North Carolina Japan Center under the Office of Global Engagement at NC State University. I'm honored to be joined today by Mr. George Takei. George is a celebrated and venerated actor, author, social media icon, champion of the LGBTQ plus community and equal rights, and a living witness to the forced relocation and internment of 120,000 Japanese Americans on U.S. soil during World War II. His newest publication, a graphic memoir titled They Called Us Enemy, details his and his family's experience during this dark chapter in American history. George, thank you for making time to speak with me today. It's a it, great honor. It's my pleasure to be with you. And uh, I just wanted to go ahead and dive right into it. So you have been present in, uh, in many forms of media uh, to speak about, in addition to, of course, other topics, the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. May I ask you to just give us a brief overview of Executive Order 9066, uh, issued by, of course, FDR, President Roosevelt in 1942, and the consequences that that had for you and your family and, of course, thousands and thousands of other Japanese Americans during that time? Well, uh, after the bombing of uh, Pearl Harbor by Japan in, uh, on December 7, 1941, the United States was swept up by fear. Uh, they thought possibly uh, that the, there might be bombings on the Pacific coast. And, uh, war hysteria and that swept across the country. Uh, we look just like the people at bombed Pearl Harbor. We're Americans. My mother was born in San Francisco, I mean uh, in Sacramento. My father was born in Japan, but his mother died shortly uh, when he was a boy. And my widow, uh, widower grandfather uh, decided to come to America. This was before, uh, this was, uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, uh, and my paternal grandfather brought his two boys, uh, my father being the younger, uh, to San Francisco. And uh, he uh, was reared and educated in San Francisco. He felt he was a San Franciscan. He lived in Los Angeles longer in, uh, uh, than he lived in San Francisco, but he kept calling himself a San Franciscan. <laughs> I think once you're a San Franciscan, you're always a San Franciscan. Uh, so uh, my parents were, uh, uh, my father was American in spirit. My mo uh, mother was American by birth. Uh, they met and married in Los Angeles, and uh, my brother and sister and I were born in Los Angeles. We're Americans, but we looked exactly like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. And the war hysteria was combined with racism. Uh, President Roosevelt got stampeded by that sweep of generalization uh, that we uh, are a threat to the national security of the United States. And he signed that executive order, which allowed uh, the rounding up with no charges, with no trial, due process, the cent central pillar of our justice system, simply disappeared with no evidence of any of the uh, suspicions held about us that were potential spies, saboteurs, and uh, fifth columnists. We were rounded up and forcibly imprisoned in 10 of the most desolate places in the United States. We were uh, sent to the uh, uh, swamps of Arkansas, a camp called Roar. There were two camps in uh, the blistering hot desert in Arizona. Uh, there were camps on the high, uh, high plains, windswept, bitterly cold, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, and two in the, uh, of the most desolate places in California held uh, two uh, barbed wire concentration camps for all rights and purposes. And uh, that's where uh, four years of our lives were spent, the duration of the war. And when the war was uh, over, just as irrationally, the uh, gates were thrown open and we were 
freed. I understand. So I, I had read that, and I hadn't known this, I know that you, you and your family had been in Camp Rower and then transferred to uh, Tool Lake in Northern California. That's right. What I hadn't known was that before your arrival in Arkansas, you were in at the Santa Anita racetrack. That's right. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Um, the uh, barbed wire uh, camps were not uh, were under construction uh, after uh, February 19th when uh, President Roosevelt signed that executive order. We were rounded. I turned five years old in April, April 20th, 1942, and a few weeks after that, my parents got me up very early one morning together with my brother, who was four, and my baby sister, who was still an infant. They dressed us hurriedly, and uh, my brother and I were told to wait in the li living room while our parents did some last minute uh, packing back in the bedroom. So the two of us were just gazing out the front window when suddenly we saw two soldiers marching up our driveway, carrying rifles with shiny bayonets on them. They stomped up the porch and with their fists began pounding on the door. My father came out uh, from the bedroom and answered the door and literally at gunpoint, we were ordered out of our home. My father gave my brother and me small packages to carry and, we, and he hefted two heavy uh, looking uh, uh, suitcases and we followed him out and stood on the driveway waiting for uh, our mother to come out. And when she came out, she had our baby sister in one arm, a huge duffel bag in the other, and tears were streaming down uh, her face. The um, camps were, not, uh, were still under construction, so we were taken to a nearby racetrack, Santa Anita Racetrack, which was called the Assembly Center. Uh, but there were chain link fences around this once glamorous uh, racetrack where Hollywood stars uh, gathered glamorously dressed. The uh, chain link fence had concertina wires over them. It was a prison camp and we were, um, we were unloaded uh, on, from the truck and uh, herded over to the stable area and each family was assigned a horse stall where horses were kept still pungent with the stink of horse manure to a stable. Um, there were two parallel stories here. For my parents, it was a degrading, humiliating, painful thing to go from a two-bedroom home on Garnet Street in Los Angeles, taking their children into a confining uh, horse stall, crammed with cots, no space to walk. We had to crawl over the cots to get over to the far cot. And for me, a five-year-old kid, it was fun to sleep where the horses sleep. I can smell them. So two parallel stories, which I tell in the, the uh, graphic memoir, yes. uh, they called us enemy. Uh, the shower area was an open uh, area where horses were washed down. It was degrading. But, uh, you know, of course, you know, in the graphic memoir and, of course, in other places where you've written and, and given interviews, um, talking about it, that experience through your eyes as a, a small boy and how that was very different from what your parents experienced. And you had also mentioned that this was something, and certainly understandably so, that that generation after this event didn't talk about. No. And that as a result, there are a large number of people who don't know this part of their familial history and a part of their cultural history. And so certainly, you know, the, what you've written about, and of course your performances, you know, Allegiance, which is just absolutely wonderful uh, Broadway play and you know uh, getting it out there more about this information this happened um, of course is incredibly important 
It's vitally important to talk about it. Uh, yes, so many of my parents' generation were so wounded, pained, and shamed by that uh, experience. And the shame was in the wrong place. The shame was the government's shame. And yet the victims took on that shame as well. And for understandable reasons, they didn't talk about it. They, it, it was personally painful, but they didn't want to inflict that pain on their children, which was mistaken, but it's understandable. And they didn't talk about it. However, my father did. And so as a teenager, when I became very curious about uh, uh, what I knew to be my childhood imprisonment uh, and couldn't find anything about it in our history books, I became a voracious reader. I read uh, the civics books, hoping there might be something there. I found nothing on the internment, but I found the noble ideals of our democracy and I couldn't reconcile the two. And so I had many, many after dinner conversations with my father. Some of them got quite heated because I was an idealistic young kid. You know, I'd been listening to eloquent speeches by Dr. Martin Luther King on the radio and uh, I was inspired by them. And I kept saying, but daddy, but daddy, that was wrong. And I would have done this, I would have done that. I, my father said, well, yeah, I can see you doing that. But this is how I felt. I had to think about your mother, your brother, your sister, and you. They're pointing guns at me. If something happened to me, what do you think would happen to your mother? All you guys. And I understood that part, but I kept saying, but daddy. And so my father was the one who explained to me about American democracy. He said it's a people's democracy. And the people have the capacity to do great things. Those ideals that you're reading about in the civics books. But the people are also fallible human beings. And people make mistakes. President Roosevelt during the 30s was a great president. Uh, we had a crushing depression at that time. People were lining up in long lines, hungry, unemployed. It was a, a devastating time for America. And President Roosevelt, with his political savvy connections and his creative problem solving, was able to make, create jobs, make post offices, roads, bridges, and pull the country up. He was a great president, but a president is also a human being with all of the fallibilities. And when a great president makes mistakes, he makes great mistakes that have painful consequences. And we were the ones that were pained by it. Our democracy is dependent on people who cherish those noble ideals and actively participate in a participatory democracy. Our democracy is existentially dependent on people who cherish the ideals and work and participate within that government to try to make it a true democracy. And I kept saying, but daddy, but daddy. And so he said, let me show you how it's got to work. And one Sunday morning, he drove me down to the Adlai Stevenson for President campaign headquarters. And there I saw all these other people passionately dedicated to getting this great and eloquent governor of Illinois elected president. And I understood what it takes and so in many ways, my father shaped who I am and made me the activist that I became. And certainly, you know, especially from reading, from reading this, that affection and respect and admiration for your father was in, in, is incredibly clear in this. During that time, um, I believe you volunteered 
at the uh, the campaign headquarters. Was it for that the, particular? The there was a campaign headquarters that you were volunteering in when you, during, I believe, perhaps it was your teenage years or. Uh, that was the Adley Stevenson for, uh, president campaign headquarters. And there was a guest who came to that campaign headquarters. Can you talk a little bit about that? Ah, uh, yes. Um, one day, this whispered, uh, excited uh, uh, electricity went through the uh, campaign headquarters. She's coming, she's coming. Who's coming? Mrs. Roosevelt's coming. And I was excited. I'd read about her and seen her photos in the, the newspapers, and she was a great first lady, an extraordinary first lady. And I was excited. But my father suddenly felt uncomfortable. He said, uh, uh, I think I better go, uh, go b home and rest. And uh, he dis uh, excused himself. I was excited. And the uh, campaign uh, headquarters uh, people had us all, the volunteers all line up by the doorway. And, and then the black suited, sharp eyed men came looking mm -hmm. all over. Certainly, yes. <laughs> they were the uh, uh, CIA people or uh, FBI people, I guess. And uh, uh, then in swept uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, and she went down the line, shaking everybody's hand, mm -hmm. smiling her full teeth in a smile, mm -hmm. and uh, thanking us for our uh, contribution to Adlai's campaign. And I can't tell you how thrilled it was for a teenage me to shake the first former first lady's hand. And uh, it was an exciting moment, but my daddy wasn't there. And I later speculated why. Did you ever talk about that with him? Or was it simply? I never did, no. no. I, I understood my father enough by that time to, to know not uh, put him through that discomfort. Was it your father who had talked to you about the, the, the in Japanese, gamang? Gamang, yes. Was that, did that come from your father? Was yes. he the one? Could you yes. talk a little bit about that and where, where did that, do you remember when he first, you know, said that to you? Well, um, so many uh, Japanese parents, Japanese American parents were telling their children um, who uh, spoke on the internment, uh, they used the phrase uh, shikata ga nai, nothing could be done, which was such a passive reaction. Yes. Uh, my father said, uh, there's something else that made it possible for us to survive that, and it was gamang, uh, resilience. And he said, uh, resilience, gamang, isn't just biting the bullet and tightening the muscles. It's to be human and survive. And that, that means also the strength to find beauty in harsh circumstances. That's also being human and determination to survive, to find or create joy, human uh, enjoyment of what it means to be human, and maybe to find love. And, and people go, did get married in camp. And he said, that's a part of the, the thing called resilience or gamang, and to maintain your dignity under these difficult circumstances. And uh, so when we started developing uh, allegiance and uh, our composer lyricist was looking for some word that could become uh, a um, iconic song for, and that captures that uh, uh, not passive and and uh, inactive, shikataganai, nothing could be done. That uh, affirmative uh, uh, word for resilience, and that's where that song Gamang came about. I, I read certainly, uh, and of course in, in, in the graphic memoir um, about your father, uh, Takikuma Norman Takei, and 
you talked a bit and wrote a bit about his roles, I believe, at both of the camps as a block manager. Yes. How did that come about? Was it simply a natural progression of his place in the community, or was it something that he was very passionate about doing, or it was something where he felt the responsibility, or a combination of all of those? Well, it was combined, but the, the people that were the uh, identified leaders of the community, like the Ken Jinkai president, the prefectural organization president, they were uh, rounded up immediately after uh, December 7th. On, the night of December 7th, December 8th, and December 9th, uh, they were rounded up. And that so-called leaders of the community uh, included Buddhist ministers, Japanese language teachers, uh, judo instructors, uh, and the president of uh, the Bonsai Association, flower arrangement or uh, miniature... Uh, uh, Ikebana. Ikebana. Uh, uh, associations. They were considered ominous threats to the government because they were leaders of the community. My father wasn't part of that. He, he was middle-aged and, you know, making a living. And so he wasn't considered the uh, threat to national security. However, my, my father spoke both Japanese and English fluently. And uh, he was able to communicate with the immigrant generation as well as the American-born, English-speaking generation. So he was uh, uh, asked to serve as the block manager in both the Arkansas camp and later the uh, uh, segregation camp for disloyals at Tule Lake. And let's, I'd like to get into that just a little bit. So could you tell us a little bit about the loyalty questionnaire and specifically about questions 27 and 28 and how your parents specifically answered those questions and the consequences of that? Well, immediately after uh, Pearl Harbor, many uh, young Japanese Americans, like many uh, um, American the young people, rushed to uh, uh, their recruitment centers to volunteer to serve in the U.S. military. Patriotic Very pa patriotic act. This was answered by uh, the denial of their uh, volunteering for the, uh, for the military. And they were categorized as enemy alien. It was totally irrational. Here are patriots volunteering to possibly die for America. And to call them the enemy made absolutely no sense. It was crazy. And equally crazy was to call them aliens. They were not alien. They were born here, raised here, educated here. And then they were put into these prison camps for a year. And then the government realized there's a wartime manpower shortage. We don't have enough people. And here are all these people, young people, that they could have had but they had categorized as enemy aliens. How to justify drafting people out of an American concentration camp? Their solution was as crazy as the imprisonment itself. It was a series of loyalty questionnaire uh, questions, about 30 uh, questions. Two of the most controversial that turned all 10 camps into confusion and outrage uh, were questions 27 and 28. Question 27 asked, and, and everyone over the age of 17 had to respond to the loyalty questionnaire, men or women, 17 or 87. Question 27 asked, will you bear arms to defend the United States of America? This be, being asked of my mother, who had three young children, by that time, I was six, my brother was five, my baby sister was a toddler. She was being asked to abandon us and bear arms to defend the nation that's imprisoning her family. It was preposterous. My mother answered no, as did my father. Question 28 was one sentence with two conflicting ideas. It asked, Will you 
swear your loyalty to the United States of America and for swear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan. Loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? We're Americans. We never even thought of the Emperor, much less swear loyalty to the, to the Emperor. And for the government to assume, presume, that there is an existing racial inborn loyalty to the emperor was insulting. So if he answered no, meaning I don't have a loyalty to the emperor to forswear, that no applied to the first part as well, which uh, asked, will you swear your loyalty to the United States? If you answered yes, meaning I do swear my loyalty to the United States, then that uh, yes, applied to the second part, meant that you were confessing that you had been loyal to the emperor and were now prepared to forswear that loyalty and repledge your loyalty to the United States. It was um, offensive, insulting. So my parents answered, no, it was uh, preposterous. The uh, writer of that question was ignorant. And because of that, they were categorized as disloyal, and we had to be transferred from Rohr, the Arkansas camp, to what they called a segregation camp for disloyals in Northern California, right by the Oregon border, a camp called Tule Lake. And the overreaction was as equally crazy. It was not just one layer of barbed wire fence, but two more layers three layers of barbed wire fences, and a half a dozen tanks patrolling the peri perimeter. Tanks guarding people that were goaded into outrage by the government's stupidity. And now they're using tanks which belong on a battlefield rather than outraged American citizens uh, uh, and intimidating them with tanks rumbling around the perimeter. You had also described the sentry towers there. And if I had seen the depiction correctly uh, in the graphic memoir, in Arkansas, this, there were sentry towers, but they were just, they had regular rifles. Uh, right. Was, how was it different? At they had searchlights, they had machine guns. It was a concentration camp. What was waiting for your family when you were released from that, from Tula Lake in 19, it was 1946? 46. Actually, uh, uh, from 19, late in 1945, uh, one could leave. Uh, it, it was at, uh, formally going to be cl uh, closed uh, and people let out uh, finally uh, in March of 1946. My father uh, left earlier uh, in uh, 19, uh, I think it was December of 1945. Uh, their decision, decision was to go back to Los Angeles. And they, the rumor was that it was still intensely hostile and it would it'd be very difficult. So he left first to uh, scout out uh, what Los Angeles was like. And uh, he uh, said, uh, our mother would stay with us uh, until he uh, writes her and tell, uh, tells her it's okay. And so we were there until February of uh, 1946. And when you went back to Los Angeles, where did your family reside? Housing was impossible. The only place we could find housing, and we were impoverished. You know, they took everything from us. Uh, I, uh, was on Skid Row, and that to us was the next terrifying moment. We were free. We didn't understand what that word meant because this was a horrific hellhole. Chaos, sheer chaos, noise, brawling, uh, s smelly, ugly, scary people staggering about, leaning on the walls, fighting each other, braying at each other. Women were shrieking and pulling uh, each other's hair. Uh, the stench of human waste was unbearable in places, on the street, in the hallways. Uh, 
the uh, shrieking of sirens day and night, and at night our skid row room would suddenly glow, throb red w from the uh, police you, car's uh, oh. red light. Uh, it was horrifying. And one day we, we were walking down the sidewalk, and this derelict came staggering toward us, glaring at us, you know. And uh, we, we stopped. We thought he was going to attack us. And then j uh, suddenly he collapsed right in front of us and barfed. And my baby sister said, shrieked, Mama, let's go back home. What did home mean? Home. She was an infant when she, we went into the internment camp. That was all she knew. And at least there, behind the barbed wire fence, there was order, regimentation. It wasn't this chaos and noise all the time. She wanted to go back behind barbed wire fences because being freed was such a horrific, harrowing experience for us kids. I understand. I'd like to uh, go ahead and move on to uh, the when President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, uh, also known as H.R. 442, uh, named after the 442nd Infantry Regiment, the most decorated unit of World War II, comprised almost entirely of Japanese Americans, mostly Nisei. Who Sek came from behind barbed wire imprisonment. And yet, and then they were put into a segregated all Japanese American unit sent to the battlefields of Europe. The Japanese American uh, uh, Nisei soldiers uh, were put into a segregated all Japanese American unit. To the, uh, they were sent to the battlefields of Europe and they fought with incredible courage and, and he literally heroism. Uh, they sustained the highest combat casualty rate of any unit uh, of the Second World War, came back the most decorated unit, welcomed back to the United States on the White House lawn by President Harry Truman, who said to them, you fought not only the enemy, but prejudice, and you won. The Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which uh, President Reagan signed, was, you know, the this is a federal law that, among other things, provided reparations of $20,000 per surviving internee. I believe at that point, out of the 120,000 Japanese Americans who had been interned, only about 60,000 were left at that point. My father had passed in 1979, and he was the one in our family who most bore the pain and the outrage and the anguish of internment the most and he passed without ever knowing that there would be that apology and that token redress and that, that was the, the later part of my question what he would have thought when he heard president reagan's words when he said what is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor for here we admit a wrong here we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law and I couldn't help but wonder what he would have thought hearing those words at that ceremony. Well, when uh, I was a teenager and having those uh, after-dinner conversations with him, he did talk about equal justice under the law, which d was, in our case, not true. And he was hoping that by our active participation in the process, that we would make that kind of violation not happen again, that there would be a truer equal justice under the law. He died never to know that. But I'm sure that uh, if he had been alive, he would have felt very, very fulfilled I don't know whether that's so quite the word or not, but I to know that uh, there would be that next step of uh, understanding on the level of the, of the government yes. that they can fail and that it's very important for people who cherish ideals of our democracy and our justice system, like uh, equal justice under the law, to be faithful to it. and. Uh, it's, uh, it's that 
hope that my father had that has shaped me to be an advocate for uh, that kind of understanding of our system that we have to participate in make, keeping it true because we have fallible human beings in our people's democracy. And the reason I wrote uh, the uh, uh, graphic uh, memoir, uh, they called us Enemy, uh, it's aimed at, you know, I grew up on comic books. We want to reach the next generation of Americans, the teenagers and the young adult readers. Uh, at, you know, because at that age, they're most uh, eager to absorb information that will stay with them through the rest of their lives. And with that kind of uh, understand, uh, a populace that has that understanding of our history, we will hopefully avoid <clears throat> the kind of uh, situation that we have now on our southern border, where that same kind of sweeping generalization that we were subjected to after Pearl Harbor. Now it's their drug dealers, the rapists, murderers, that kind of generalization, or uh, the first uh, Trump executive order, uh, the Muslim travel ban, characterizing all Muslims as potential terrorists, that mentality uh, will be in the minority and that the majority of Americans will really truly understand how precious but also how fragile the ideals of our democracy are. Equal justice under the law. This is a nation ruled by the rule of law. These are precious de uh, defining ideals of our democracy, but it's also a people's democracy. It's up to us. It's up to us. It's a participatory democracy. We have to actively participate. We who cherish those ideals. Our democracy is existentially dependent on people who cherish those ideals involved in the process of democracy. Number one, to vote. Number two, to volunteer to support the kind of candidates that uh, they share those ideals with. Number three, they might be appointed to uh, s ask to serve on a public commission or a board, and ultimately to consider offering yourself to run for public elective office to represent the people who cherish those ideals. Thank you so much for these words and for make, again for making time in your incredibly busy schedule to speak with me today. Okoshi itadakimashite domo arigatou gozaimasu. Do itashimashite and thank you for thank doing you for what coming. you're doing. And I uh, I do want to say here the this wonderful graphic memoir they called us enemy. I just learned from you reached the New York Times bestseller list. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the AMC, uh, The Terror, Season 2, which takes place in, in the same setting that, yes. that we discussed. Um, so again, thank you so much for well, coming today. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. You're one of the people that is uh, actively participating in our participatory democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.